Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you are in the world, and welcome to this TechStrong learning experience brought to you by DevOps.com. My name is Cody J. Brown. I'm the host of TechStrong Learning, and we have an exciting program ahead. First, I have just a couple of housekeeping notes to cover. Today's session is being recorded, so if you miss any of our discussion, perhaps you'd like to rewatch or share with a friend. The on-demand recording will be made available shortly after we conclude our live session today. If you want to communicate with our, um, our panelists, our speakers today, you can do so on the right side of the screen using that first tab that says chat. I'd like you to start warming that up for me now by letting us know from where you are tuning in. If you have any questions, you can send those in to us using the Q&A tab, which is directly to the right of that chat tab. Now, uh, stick around until the end of today's program as we are giving away four $25 Amazon gift cards. And to kick off our conversation today, our topic is continuous integration and continuous deployment. I'm joined by Sharon Florentine, Managing Editor at TechStrong Group, and Mitch Ashley, CTO at TechStrong Group and Principal at TechStrong Research. So Sharon and Mitch, thank you both so much for joining me. Mitch, do you want to go ahead and get us kicked off? Well, I am. Actually, I think Sharon's kind of running the show here, but that's okay. <laughs> we work together, so uh, which is it was a lot of fun. So uh, it's great to be here with you, Sharon, talking about CICD. Absolutely. Um, obviously, as managing editor, um, and I am in charge of DevOps.com, so we get a lot of great stuff coming through about CICD. Um what I notice a lot is that despite the two terms being only separated by that little backslash, um, we hear a lot more about CI and the integration piece of it than the CD part. Um, so let's just jump in right there. Um, why, why is that? Why hasn't the CD half of things really gained as much mass adoption as CI? It's a good it's a good question and there's actually some really good reasons for it. And just so everyone knows, I've, I've managed development teams myself and done product and IT uh, delivery, uh, deployments of applications and started my DevOps journey in, I think, 2013, something like it. And I, like many, many others, started with continuous integration. And it's it actually started before even doing DevOps is we had sort of build Fridays, right? Everybody would integrate their code, check it in. We all do the build at a certain time and pray we weren't the person that broke it and had to stay and fix it so everybody could go home. So we started to automate that more and more. And continuous integration is really a, just a fundamental part about how we create, update, change, add to our code base in a repository. So it makes a lot of sense that uh, integration happens as we check in pieces of code. So we don't have it all checked in all at once and then integrate a whole bunch of changes at some point in the future on Fridays or once a month, or can you imagine doing that right now? Oh, once a month, that would be a long weekend. So we really fix issues as you go. Um, and that's why with DevOps, that's kind of the starting place because you're using a repository, which you probably are anyway. Uh, often, most oftentimes it's Git or some kind of distributed uh, repository and you're building automation into this so that, okay, you push, push up your changes into Git or to GitHub or to whatever tool you're using because there are other tools that also use Git. And that can also then kick off other parts of the process because it isn't just checking in your code and integrating it. You usually want to fire off some portion of or series of tests. And that can happen, you know, we have, a, we have the sort of vote early, vote often, well, test early, test often, right? And the, you know, the more you test it, especially if you can automate it, by the time you get to some sort of a deploy phase or deploy step, you know, you've already tested it hundreds, maybe thousands of times on different test scripts and scenarios, which drives up quality. So that's all part of that first thing, usually the people, that first step that folks take, I think the corollary to that, the continuous deploy, is a little more challenging because we were coming from a world where we have pretty large, or maybe monolith, uh, monolithic releases and applications. And just like that, checking it all in, and then we wait until some point in the future and then integrate it all and find out all the problems, 
Same thing happens when we go to deploy with large pieces of code, with large applications, is they're complex. There's a lot of steps and testing and people approvals. We've had to have a peop- uh, approval from QA, approval from uh, operations that it's going to run in production, approval from uh, product management, et cetera, et cetera. Right? We're used to these kind of stage gates because we only did it once a quarter, twice a year, maybe once a year. And continuous deployment is about, let's do this on a, you know, once a quarter is not continuous. I think something less frequent than that is right. required for de- continuous. And so there's a lot more things to change about how we work, including the code itself. And we can talk about some of that if you want to. Yeah, yeah, that totally makes sense. That makes sense. Um, so d- do you think that focus then will start to shift a little bit with the rise of Kubernetes and serverless computing frameworks? Well, it, as it happens, Kubernetes, Kubernetes micro, microservices, which are all part of cloud native containerization, uh, they're all about making things smaller. You know, containers was, well, you can put big things in containers, but generally you put a few things in there, a microservice or two, things that can be autonomously deployed, independently deployed. In other words, I can change my algorithm for calculating this kind of interest without changing the whole interest calculation module, right? I can just change one microservice. And when you make things smaller, now you can test them incrementally and have fewer dependencies that you would have to resolve in a deployment phase. And if you can, as you start to make those, um, you know, independent enough with microservices, which is kind of the whole design principle behind microservices, then I can deploy them when I need to. Now, there are other factors, you know, quality of it. Do you have some governance you have to go through, security, all of that? Is all of that taken care of earlier in your process, either during development and integration or some automated testing? If it is, you can go to an automated deploy phase, uh, or not phase, but step really yeah. for that one piece of code. Uh, but it takes breaking down the work into much smaller pieces uh, than they typically have been, which fits well with the cloud native kind of architecture. And it also means that those other steps have to be addressed in an automated fashion for you to be in a continuous deploy, likely a continuous check-in. Now, most people are not there. That's a big step. Or seriously. A lot of big steps. Yeah. So, but that that's and, and the other thing is not everybody in the company may go there, right? I might have a big app that is, you know, we're maybe putting in microservices in a little part of it, but the rest of it's still a, 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 a monolithic application. I may also have be on this other project, which is a brand new cloud native app, and you know, we're doing all these cool things to make it small and lightweight and quick, and you can deploy it quickly. So. Different parts of the organization may be on different journeys towards DevOps, towards CICD, maybe cloud native, maybe not. Yeah. Well, and that's that's an interesting point about um, making all of those smaller increments much more automated. Um, you know, we're already, DevOps workflows are already to some extent automated a lot. So, I mean, mm-hmm. How automated can these workflows get? Are we trying to push toward a 100% completely automated all the way through? Yeah. Well, maybe if we uh, do generative AI and it can write the code for us, then it can all be automated. That's a whole other question. (laughs) We're going to do, but yeah, exactly. Though though you would not know that by reading some articles, not necessarily on DevOps.com, but you know, it's a, it's a, like how much to automate, right? That's always the question. How much testing to automate? How much of the DevOps pipeline tool chain is automated? Hello, puppy. I have my puppies next to me too. So <laughs> no every one. time, every time. <laughs> Guaranteed. UPS will deliver, dogs will bark. Two things will always happen. Um, so I, I, the way I look at automation is there's things that you do repetitively, and by doing them in an automated way can help either help people be more productive, improve quality, actually improve security by shifting left and doing some of those things. 
those are all things, you know, do, do I as a developer want to go kick off a script to do integration? Well, no, I don't. Do I want to kick off the script that's going to do code scanning for vulnerabilities? No. Do I want to kick off the script that's going to do um, a software decomposition analysis? Do I want to kick off the script that's going to do a software bill of materials, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera? Probably none of those. I might want to initiate a few on my own at times, but as a continuous process, that's part of that automation. Is it will it be always all automated? I doubt that. And, and it is that kind of that deploy step of what are we going to push to production? What environments are we pushing into production? Might be ready to go into my Amazon environment. It might not be ready to go out in this serverless part that's running at the edge in some other you know, environment that's not even familiar to us, maybe running a lighter weight Kubernetes than what I run in my cloud or cloud environment. So that's the other factor too, is is not a serial process or linear process anymore. It can be, but oftentimes we're deploying to multiple test environments, yeah. to multiple cloud environments, or even within one cloud, multiple configurations of it, current, past, future, you know, current state, et cetera. And so that's all great. And automation helps us do that quicker. You know, doing all of those steps you know, either in serial or adding more people to do it and do them in parallel, much rather have them creating new things and addressing issues that come up. Yeah. Okay. So you mentioned the generative AI piece and I have to go there because chat GPT and other generative AI solutions are taking over all of our headlines and so, I mean, what, what role will that play? Um, you know, we're already seeing some companies are figuring out ways to, to integrate it into testing um, to help devs write test scripts and, and all that stuff. But um, beyond that, what other applications will it have? Well, it's interesting because I've done some work in AI throughout my career too. And we've always talked about AI replacing humans. Mm -hmm. And while it generally has happened in a few cases like robotics and manufacturing and you know, some safety things, most of the time new technology doesn't replace us. It changes what we do because it acts as an aid or automates things for us we don't have to do anymore so we do you know, more higher value things. And a, generative AI is not new in coding. If any IDE that you work in or this Visual Studio code or it's um, you know, Python environment or whatever it might be, IntelliJ, you know, pick your favorite IDE. They all have kind of code completion logic built into it. Some of that has already been uh, generative AI. I mean, Visual Studio has had IntelliCode in it for, what, two, three years? Maybe, maybe more than that. So it's been a I know the context, I know the things you're working on, what is what is the probability or what is the, given the data that I have, likelihood that you're gonna to wanna to do next. And it's using that, not guessing, but using that informed analysis and that informed AI to help you act as an aid. Now imagine where I hope it goes is if I'm a developer building things, I would love to have generative AI know about all the open source that's been created and all the variations of a subroutine or a method or an object or a, parts of an application that already exist. I just don't either know where to look or have the time to look. Right. Put that in my code for me you know, and then have that be the start that, that I enhance and change and modify. Uh, maybe a little, maybe a lot. Yeah. But if I could take some of those things that... Um, I don't know if I call them monotonous, but I just have to do them all the time, just kind of part of the world that you live in and that language or that environment. So I think, you know, in generative AI uh, as a category, will definitely is already and will definitely increasingly help us with writing software for the better. Will it write software for us completely? Well, there have been code generators since, I don't know, probably the 70s and 80s. Yeah wrote code for you, nobody can maintain it because it's so cryptic. Yeah. Um, I don't. I think we're gonna have code written for us that we can use maybe without modification. You know, this, this kind of goes back to the CD, but will I trust it? 
am I going to really rely on that and just push it out and run my tests through it? Maybe after I've done it a hundred times or a thousand times or something that I know I can trust it. it. It'll be a process. Now you mentioned ChatGPT, which is about kind of writing, generating more than just code. You know, I, I think we'll see, like build my compliance report for me. Here's all the data that I've got. And you know, we know what the issues are. Fill it into the same report that I wrote the last 20 times that yeah. I needed to do that quarterly or annual report. I'll do some sanitizing, you know, correcting, make sure that it's fully accurate or put more of the analysis, the thoughts of the auditor or whatever it may be, uh, of the analyst or something like that. Sure, I think we'll see a lot of that. Maybe we already are and don't know it. But yeah. <laughs> so yes, it's 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 with us, it will be with us. It's not going to replace all the developers in the world. We don't need you anymore. Just like DevOps didn't replace operations or security or, you know, test or any of the other things that it was, you know, only developers were going to be needed. Yeah. No, it's not going to happen. At least yeah. You. I mean, I'm curious. What What do you think? Because you work in the world of Ch Chat GPT and generative AI and in, in the content world, right? Yeah, and it's um, it's it's the same kind of similar conversation that okay, well now we have bots that can write entire articles, um, and it's interesting because you know as an editor I use Grammarly after I process and edit something just to double check, and um, it's a great when it's the end of the day and my eyes are blurring from, you know, reading so much and editing so much, it will always pick up. I missed a comma or there's an extra space or, oh my God, this word was spelled wrong. And I just, my brain just completely didn't see it. So, and it's been interesting to me using it as a technology editor because it, it still doesn't pick up on a lot of the, the nomenclature, it has no idea. Mm -hmm. um, and um, some of the jargon it misses or it tries to completely, um, you know, it'll red flag things that I'm like, no, that's correct. That's how that's phrased in this, um, you know, in this industry. And so I have to correct it and edit it and just double check it. So I think it's the same thing. Like it's very useful as a, as a backstop. Um, and, uh, you know, I run it at the end just to make sure I didn't miss anything. And then it goes on to the next step. So it's definitely helpful. It saved my butt a number of times. <laughs> um, but, but yeah, it's. What's interesting is when I write, I often write in Grammarly, including the stuff I send you. Oh. So it's, so it's hopefully much better than what I would have sent to you without. without. <laughs> so you use it as a backstop. And someone less skilled in, in that area, like myself, use it as a kind of aid, as a, yeah. you know, assistance yep. as I'm creating. So it kind of depends, you know, you can use it in different ways. Same thing for development, right? Imagine mm -hmm. brand new developer. I'm, I'm working on my first couple of projects here. Okay. I don't even know what I don't know yet, right? <laughs> right. Kind of taking all that stuff I learned in school or boot camp and trying to apply it versus You've been doing code development for 20 or 30 years and yeah, I've already got, got a pretty good feel for things, but I can use it as an additional aid. So it all depends on where you are on the, on the spectrum of skill in that particular area. If I was going to write a medical report, which I'm not going to, mm. I wouldn't know where to start. Right? So <laughs> there's one end of the spectrum. Yeah. So we're not writing any medical reports. No, let's not go there. That's a whole different animal. <laughs> <laughs> um, so when we were talking about automation and AI and stuff, it, you know, my mind kind of makes a, a connection between that and, and GitOps in that you, you have a, and it, it's not necessarily the same because you have a single source of truth in your repository and it's, it's, trying to connect back and, and double check, like we were talking about, that everything matches up before the process can, can continue. Um, so what is the, is that the correct 
connection for me to be making? How does GitOps fit into this conversation if it does at all? And how do you, well, I don't know. I'll stop there. I won't throw six questions out at the same <laughs> okay. time. Well, you're welcome to. I don't know if I can okay. answer six, but I will give my best shot. Mm -hmm. So, so uh, a repository is central to doing anything, especially DevOps, right? Because yeah. it's pretty tough. I guess you could read files off of a file server and do continuous integration, but it would mm -hmm. be pretty bad. So you, you've got a repository, Git, or you know, something like it. GitOps, and what, what are you putting in, in that repository? We can put anything in it. You could put documentation, you could code, you could put uh, images, you could use it as a artifact repository, lots of things. But generally, you're putting in things about an application and maybe some of the middleware code that you're using, libraries, function packages, um, scripts and other sources, open source, whatever it might be. That can go in, in your repository, either in your, your, your main tree, the root, or on branches of that as you branch the code, branch the repository. But then you're deploying it into an environment that's been either with scripts or manually set up. Here's the operating system. Here's the database that's been put on that. Here's the Kubernetes environment that's been put on that. Here's Docker that's going to manage our containers. Here's all the stuff that you deploy your application on to test it or to deploy it in production. GitOps is, and that's that's built by someone through scripts or by hand, generally speaking. Right. GitOps is this idea of you can declare what your environment is and build the entire environment from the, everything that's in the repository. So if I wanted to say, um, I want you to take this version from this branch of the tree and build it over in this environment, my test environment, or I've been, you know, Azure or wherever I'm at, Google. And it has all of that environment. And if I need to make a change, I may, may make a change in, uh, you know, on Helm or other declarative environment and then push it out again. And it pushes out those changes in, to the environment I'm pushing it to, you know, production or test or even my dev site. So it's, it's taking the infrastructure adding it to what we do for the application, it's all in a repository and it all can be deployed straight from it. Now, there are people who know this much better than I do. Uh, Tracy Reagan is one of the folks that I'm up here talking about GitOps because she can really get into the finer yeah. details about how microservices and variations of different pieces of code all can be defined and done in this declarative fashion. Right. So it's it's not something everybody is doing. It's not necessarily something everyone wants to do or even could do yet. Yeah. Um, but it it's a way where you're spending less time creating the environment you're running in, and more and more time just focusing on the whole process of getting code into production, whatever part it's in. Kind gotcha. of all from a developer perspective, if you want to think of it that way. Okay, that totally makes sense. So you um, could do CICD. Matter of fact, you will do CICD in, in similar or the same form in GitOps, right? GitOps is just expanding what, you, what you're doing in that process. It's, it's a simple explanation. It's right. probably about 80% accurate in most cases, but it is directionally correct. Good <laughs> enough for me. 80%, I'll take it. <laughs> Sometimes it's good enough. Yeah. We'll, we'll have to get Tracy on the, on the next time we do this. She can set us straight. We should have a session on GitOps. I mean, I'm sure she has some other go-to people. Absolutely. Right. Absolutely. Because I'm, that's a little over my head. <laughs> it's all, well, it's all over somebody's head. So it's okay. That's right? true. That's true. <laughs> um, let's see. So what... We we're, we've been talking about the the process of CI/CD and how it's done and what's going to help it and how we can you know make it more efficient and move along faster. But um, are CI/CD platforms actually a barrier to DevOps adoption in general? Are they so I don't know intimidating that they're like blocking people from getting some of the benefits that they would otherwise have if they 
shifted to a DevOps methodology? Well, part of it is, is what we mean by platform, right? Okay. Um, it's, it can mean a lot of things. I think I think when you're talking about a CI/CD platform, you're either talking about a full CI/CD environment that might be from a provider who's got it in the cloud, or maybe you do run it locally. But you know, here's the tool kind of soup to nuts to do CI/CD, right? Which means it's going to integrate with a lot of other things, a lot of third-party tools, all up and down the tool chain for DevOps. Uh, another way to look at platform is a provider who kind of does the full DevOps process of which CICD is a part of, but does security, does developer environment, does uh, testing and production, kind of do the whole tool chain, mostly through their platform, but still with a lot of other integrations. As I might have started using Jenkins for CICD, but I'm not going to move it all go through that effort, effort, I'm going to keep it where it is and do my new stuff in the new platform. Right. So it's it's not either antithetical to doing DevOps. It's also not required to do DevOps that you have a platform. So I'm going to use the example of CICD as the platform, not the whole mm-hmm. thing, right? Yeah. Um, you know, when I started, we used, J- I mentioned Jenkins, the mm-hmm. open source. We, it was the, one of the first tools that we used. And I think it's a matter of today, if you're going to do it, you could go get an environment that uses Jenkins. You don't have to set everything up. Or you right. could use another CICD tool that will talk to Jenkins or any other number of tools. So I think it's a matter of how much time and how many variations do I have that it's just easier to build it ourselves and manage that because sometimes variations are right. too many, make a platform make it challenging. You spend more time kind of forcing the platform to work for you the way that you want. I think that's less often the case. Most of the time we can go to pick any number, you know, Circle CI is a very popular right. uh, platform. You can do this on GitHub. You can do it in a lot of environments. Um, it, it's really easy just to set it up and go. Unless I've got some, I don't want to spend my time setting up a full CI CD environment. I'd much rather even if I had some limitations, I'll live with some things just to get to the good stuff. The stuff right. I need to get done. My, my boss is not going to pay me just yeah. for setting yeah. up CSED environments. So I think it's it's actually a productivity boost and aid and helps everybody be on a similar platform, understanding you you may not really be an island. You may be part of a bigger you know, globe that everybody is doing CICD and sometimes there's gain for us to get to a common platform. Right. Even a full DevOps platform together. Just depends on the organization. Yeah. Uh, So how much does that tie into, you know, what we talked about circling back to the very beginning uh, when we talked about CD not getting as much, um, not even as much attention, but um, as much adoption. Is it, you know, do people start to build these things in house and they get through the CI, the CI part, and then they're like, I'm done. Can't do this anymore. We got CI. We're good. We can do the deployment part or the delivery part. And that's a whole other question about how do you define it? But, um, you know, do we do the CI, CI part and then do the CD part manually? I don't know. I'm just spitballing there. Well, you're, you're, you're straight on CI is where you're going to start. CI is right. the thing that's going to make the most difference. And a lot of it, I think, Sharon, de- depends on where you are and your ability to deliver things more frequently. Mm-hmm. Like. I might say, well, my, maybe my next best step is let's work on continuous deploy, but deploy into test environments. So, I'm, right. so I don't need my developer spending time to set up the configurations to push into five different environments. Let my CD tool do that. Uh, maybe I need to run canary tests. You know, if I'm, you know, using if I'm using cloud native and I can push it to that environment. Um, it's not production, so I don't have to worry about it. It's, it's going into an environment end users or the business is using. 
but you can use that may, and that may be as far as you go because going into full production is a much more complex step that involves more human or decisions in the process. Right. If you were starting out, now again, regulated, highly regulated, less or non-regulated environments all make a big difference too, right? You may just, yeah. you just may not be possible to do all the way into production deployment. A lot of people live in that world for yeah. that reason. So I think that the thing you can do is also then look at the software architecture of what you're deploying, whether you're doing cloud native or maybe SOA or different architectures. Are you, is what you want to deploy of a small enough size that you can deploy it more frequently? Are you, are you designing your software or are you redesigning it? If you're making changes in a way that you can deploy that piece independently from the rest, because if you have a lot of inter interdependencies between that, that probably means more people involved or more process involved. You still could have an automated deployment into production, just maybe you stop, you know, you know stage gates or stop along the way. So right. it's, it's, it's a lot more, it's much more difficult problem than CI because of, CI is getting all the developers and the testers and DevOps people and sysadmins together and saying, great, and we're going to do it this way. Here it goes. All right, we all do it. It gets pushed in. It happens. Wonderful. Somebody takes care of it for me. The other environment test is more like that, but getting to production is less. So unless you're starting from Greenfield and you can set it up to do it from the beginning. And uh, we would all love to do that, but... We don't, we rarely get to do <laughs> Someday, someday perhaps. I mean, you, you, you write and read and I need a lot of content in this area. Does that, does that make sense to you? Is that consistent with kind of writing and discussion? Yeah. People talking about this. Absolutely. And that's, you know, you, the, the topic of highly regulated industries comes up a lot. And I think, you know, that is a huge point that is missed that there are compliance regs and things that you know folks have to make sure that they're in alignment with before they can go into production and so you know there there's not a one size fits all you know even though i asked the question earlier i don't see a complete end to end like you push a button and it CI goes and then it flows right into CD and then it's just out there because I think there has to be some kind of checkpoints at some level just, just to make sure. Um, and especially because, and this kind of segues into um, my next question about security, obviously, because, you know, there's software supply chain attacks and, um, you know, vulnerabilities that are introduced throughout the SDLC and, you know, how, how does that fit into that? You almost have to figure out how to stop and check and make sure that these things are secure. So there's that push and pull between that need to automate and move really quickly and the need to slow down and make sure that it's secure so the you're right and I think and also another, wrong i'm sure yeah well <laughs> and they're wrong at the same time no you're actually and I, I agree with what you said and there's also the consistency argument with automation you don't have to rely on the human element to do it every time and do it accurately the, you know i might be having a bad day and i'm on the phone with you know my friend who's having a tough time and i forget to do that before right I'm deployed right just dumb example but uh, you know that automatic <laughs> also been there also been there yep. yeah their bad day is your bad day yeah but, you know we we you know it's tough for humans to be consistent 100 percent of the time and the other thing you have with automation is you have the artifact you have the 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 data showing what happened you know did that get run how many times did it get run we're in the process did it get run the problems happen did it go through Right. So I, I bring that up in security because I view security like quality is the more you do it, the more repetition there is into it, not by a person, but 
by automation in most cases. And doing it earlier in the process, the same thing that happens with quality, right? When you design it in, you test for it, you make sure that it's in there. By the time you've deployed, you know it's high quality or it's you know, much less likely to have security issues in it. Same thing with DevSecOps, right? The whole right. idea of doing security earlier in the process. Now, DevSecOps, like many things, like platforms has many definitions, but generally speaking, you know, at least it started in the let's do things like code scanning in the IDE or when it gets checked into an CI process. Um, let's do code audits and code reviews. Let's look at APIs and API security. Let's look, look at all those elements that we can see in the software as it's being created or even better, design it into the application, design a secure application for security and build it through the process. So CI, CD and DevOps tool chain in general can be a huge aid to that. It doesn't replace, I'm a developer and I might be a dang good one, but I may not be the best security person in the right. world. Probably not. There's people who know it better than I do, but they may not know development like I know do or know code and software and software architecture. So that's where we can pick the people knowledge, the people collaboration and try and work to improve security earlier in the process, all the way into production in the process. It doesn't alleviate that part as well. Yeah. You mentioned software supply chain, which is kind of another element of, of this. It has to do with security vulnerabilities and designing security in, but it, it has more, also has to do of where is that code coming from? And do you know what's in your code? Right. So software supply chain, as I know you've written about and seen many times, starts with people talk about the bill of materials, right? Well, what is in my code? Where did, where did it come from? I might have downloaded this, uh, you know, op piece of open soft software, but I got it from Mitch's hard drive over here connected to whatever, and that's been attacked and code injected to it, you know, two years ago. So I'm, I have some great code, but it's not great because <laughs> I don't know what's in it. So that, that's a big part of, of software build materials is where, what's in your code, all the elements, and what's the source of it. Sort of the, the black box of it is, and you're using services, you may be connecting through APIs and other mechanisms that also has its own uh, source of code and code security issues, right? So it's not just our own, and that's the complexity of it. Yeah. And then if, if that gets integrated, if that gets pulled into the CI portion and then it all gets automated through, then how are you, how do you stop that vulnerability from going all the way through your process? Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. And that's the good, the good side of it is if we're automated and can make changes a little more fluidly, we can fix that when we find out about it. Yeah. You know, if it's already in production and doing bad things, that's that, that we can't fix it that way. Yeah. The other thing that's interesting about software supply chain is, is it's not just source of the code that you're getting and is it, is it secure, is it clean? Um, we development teams, developers, testers are increasingly uh, the attack vector of attackers, of hackers, of mm -hmm. people who want to do malicious thing. You see more and more. I'm telling you what you what you create and read, and you read, of course, too, is developers being the target of phishing, right? To get a developer's right. credentials to get into, you know, X to, to get into everywhere else in the development process. Yeah. The tool chain, the repository. Well, right. that that's sort of like if I can get the front of the line and get my malicious code in that way, I don't have to worry about attacking your code in production. You yep. lock it down all you want and put whatever security measures. It's I already compromised it as the attacker way earlier in the process. So that's what happened actually with Solar Winds. A mm -hmm. lot of the discussion was about Solar Winds propagating updates out to its customers that have malicious code. The update process wasn't the biggest issue. Is actually they had they had attacked servers, 
and, and that were looking for specific processes to run where they were doing builds of specific software and then ran their code instead of the process that we should have run mm-hmm. got injected malicious code. And that's, that's another more complex part of software build materials. But it all fits in this whole tool chain, including CICD. It's part of it as well. So the security of our CICD, security of our whole tool chain, is just as important as the code we're writing on top of all that. Yep. It's a multi-layered challenge, right? Yes. The proverbial onion. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <laughs> um, so how do we make this simpler then? I mean, this is, we've, you've been talking about complexity and peeling back the layers of this onion. How do we make it simpler? Well, it, it, yeah, good question. Probably depends on where we're starting, right? What we've yeah. Um, my, it, this goes down probably more to personal preference. My preference is if I don't have to or I don't have to have the people that I'm working with spend our time building the tools or managing the tools or integrating the tools, because the more bigger that challenge gets, the more time we're not working on producing the output the outcome that we're trying to achieve. So I look for ways of, it could be a hosted development environment. It can be a hosted platform for CI or for CICD. Um, it could be using you know, um, automated build environments or uh, containers, containers environments that are already pre-built, pre-scanned, pre-checked. So I think as you can do more, uh, either both automation and use existing environments, components, scripts, whatever it might be, that can be checked themselves independent of what the person building the tool chain is doing, then I think those elements can be can be more secure. Now, if they aren't ever checked, then they're not going to be. So I, I'm a believer in use environments that you haven't necessarily created all yourself. Now, there are times when you need to create yourself because you can't do it the way you need to do, have it done to a third party, but you know, that that's, I think the one focus where you can get the most benefit and rely on uh, others to help you make other parts of the tool chain more secure. Um, I think the other thing, Sharon, is there's a lot of data, some people call it data exhaust that comes off Mm -hmm. of this tool chain that we're using, CICD and all of it. And it just sort of gets le- le- left on the cutting room floor, as they say in film editing, right? Yeah. And that data is extremely valuable to know, were we doing this? Was it automated? Was it happening? Did we miss one? Um, it, it's almost like a good part of our process of doing compliance reports done if we can harness that data to demonstrate, prove to ourselves that it's being done or when we find just this weird fatal flaw in something that we have in the process or the code or the tools or the integration, we can hopefully nail that down easier. I, I think that sort of the engineering of the process of DevOps and our tool chains is a great thing to invest in because now we know what really happened, not what should happen in the normative cases, right? Yeah. We've got data to go back and, but you're going to look at that data every day and pile through all, you know, Ooh. millions and millions of log entries. But that's a huge resource, a valuable resource I think you can also use to see if you're doing, taking the security steps that you think you're taking, right? Or you're maybe bypassing them. Yeah, that totally makes sense and seems much simpler because you have the data there. You may as well use it. It's there. But usually, usually the challenge is, is that in a way you can consume it and analyze it across right. different tools. And that can be an advantage of a platform approach. Right. Yeah. Largely one provider for that. Yeah. Um, so are, are these plat- are hmm. Is CICD moving to the cloud? Are these platforms, I know we've been talking about these platforms, um, are they moving to the cloud in great numbers? Is this gonna be a new era of 
cloud hosted CI CD? Well, I, I think we're kind of there. Most new products, new services in the space start out as hosted. Yeah. It's just okay. easier, you know, just my own building products. One of the toughest things is handling the installation of your stuff in an environment you don't control. Right. and all the variations and permutations and solving customer support tickets. You know, hey, we're not running that version of that. We have something else, right? And testing all of that. So generally, they tend to start in the cloud. And then in a later stage of, of a product's maturity, they'll add the uh, on-site or in your private data center or your private cloud ver version of that because some people will not, cannot run all of it or any of it in the cloud, but they want to get get the benefit of what that product does. So <clears throat> the only in the cloud model, some people do that, uh, but most usually have an on-prem version of their product that lets you do it there. Um, just like ChatGPT is not going to replace all the need for writing in the future right. of everything, right? The cloud doesn't replace the data center completely in every instance, in every case, the yeah. private data center. So I think development environments are moving to the cloud. You know, for, for, for a while, the kind of the last, I guess, 10 years or so, it's all about building the same environment on your laptop so you can develop in Starbucks or on the, on the airplane right. as much as you can and have parts of it in the cloud that you need. Now there's even technologies and products. And I tend to not mention a lot of products, by the way, just because we do analyst work. So yep. I'm not promoting individual people's products. But there are benefits that some vendors are taking. Of, Let me build your development environment mm -hmm. with your code, but also with open source code they know is secure, has been scanned, is sourced by that provider. Yep. So as much of the environment you're working in, someone ha else has checked it and verified it for security, for vulnerabilities, for patching, uh, all those kind of things. So that's another reason why we're seeing some people coming up with new technology to, for supply chain security reasons to push developer environments into the cloud. Now, some developers will not like that, some will love it. Just kind of depends on how much control you need to have. Yeah. So, but, but I think we're in the cloud era already. A lot of it happens there, and if it doesn't, uh, parts of it too. Certainly, repositories probably there if you're doing GitHub yeah. um, or using a platform. Yeah, because I mean the storage storage costs and overhead alone for storing all of that data would be ridiculous. You got to store it, and then you got to manage it. Yep. That's the other part of it. Is yeah, you know, installing the product may be easy, but managing it, you're yeah. taking on that burden. Yeah. All right. So I think we're at like, we got 10, 10 minutes or so left. Um, so I'm going to throw the big one at you and we'll see what we can come up with. What is the, what do you think the biggest challenge today is for CICD? I think we're still wrestling with the D, the CD part. Okay. That, that's not solved in, in, you know, in every case or the majority of cases for folks. Yeah. Uh, I, I see, to me, I think the biggest challenge right now is, or, and will become even increasingly more of a challenge is the supply chain security yeah. of securing that tool chain environment and the sourcing of code and your own code and that whole process. Because now you have the um, presidential order on, right. on supply software security. And part of that is supply chain. Where is the sourcing of so, uh, code that you are using coming from? And do you know it's secure? And they're actually in June, and I think the other one is September, there are two requirements that are upcoming that you have to meet. And, and one of the first ones is producing a software bill of materials. Right. That's not hard, but you got to do that every time something changes. Okay. Right? It's yep. not just last June, here's my bill of materials. It's today we changed something and here's the bill of materials mm -hmm. right now. The second part is what they call an attestation proof. Some, you are kind of like 
um, attesting to or putting your name on the line that this is what's in this code and it's been secured in this manner because it's from this source. And not that regulation is everything. Yeah, we do a lot of things because there's regulations, but they don't always apply to everyone. But this particular one is for anyone providing software, if you will, and services to the government, yep. the federal government. And all of those companies, I'm guessing all, maybe it's 99.9%, mm -hmm. use someone else's code or service as part of their service. Yeah. So I might have a, uh, a great Python package for um, drawing widgets on the screen or check error checking for security and applications. Uh, but my code is, you know, up on a, in a container somewhere on Red Hat or it's on GitHub and someone downloads that code. That's part of that, too. So while I may not have to do a bill of materials today or an attestation, I might tomorrow. Because the people will only use my code if I can provide those things. Uh, so it's a, it's a uh, kind of the chain, if you will. Of, uh, speaking of, of chain. Oh, okay. <laughs> Yes. Here's a great question from someone in the audience who's asking if we think blockchain will make things more secure and effective for the supply chain. So this is something I am fascinated by. Um, I, I mean, it will, it would, if we could figure out how to use that, you go first. I got to figure, I got to sort myself out. <laughs> well, there's, there, it's interesting. It's a great question because it was announced, I think it was last 2022 at um, KubeCon in Spain, mm -hmm. in Valencia. I, I'm trying off the top of my head to remember the project name. It's like, it's like Persia, Perseus. Per, yeah, Persia, Project Persia. Persia. And, and it, the whole idea of that project is, are you really going to trust one vendor to, to attest to this all being secure and it's sourced, mm -hmm. all that kind of stuff? And so this particular project is a combination of technology companies, and they use blockchains, which is basically, it's a not, not a single attestation by a person, but is actually you have to have enough votes, if you will, approvals. Mm -hmm majority over 50 percent in the blockchain to say yes this could be added to the blockchain well that could be code that i just checked into the repository and uh yes i say it's from me well if there are 12 other companies that say yep i know that's mitch's company and i know that's mitch the person or whatever i'm attesting to has been added and i know it's been through the following process for security then you, through a kind of distributed um, attestation, if you will, not mm -hmm. legally, but kind of functionally, that blockchain can be used to prove that, yes, it isn't just one auditor, one auditing right. company, one somebody, or a couple. It's enough that say, yes, we, do we, we agree that's secure and it's from who we think it is. That's an interesting project. It's, just, it's very much what this question is asking about. Do you think blockchain will make things more secure? Running a blockchain is a whole nother proposition, more complex than your that yeah. supply chain, trust me. Yeah. But there are projects in the, there's a project in Linux, Linux Foundation. There are probably commercial offerings either there or being developed to do something similar to this. Yep. Um, I don't know that it will be, that it's the, the, uh, you know, the golden promise of going to solve all our problems, but it could be actually extremely valuable. Yeah. Maybe some people who will not put their faith and trust in one company, and this is right. the way that they'll do it. So, yeah, the, you know, the, the immutability factor of being, being able to look at something and say, yes, this is exactly the same as when it started. It has not changed. It has not been modified or appended in any way. We can certify that it is exactly what you introduced, meant to introduce, and but it's yeah, some of the some of the what it's all protected with PKI. That's how they validate yep. the, the issued, you know, a, a 
the uh, key or a digital certificate for that addition to the chain. And that's how we know there's a way to, way to, ways to then verify if that code is still that code. Yeah. So uh, I think our answer is yes, with some caveats for implementation issues, maybe. It's a little bit <laughs> between here and right. there. What? There's <laughs> a, a little bit of distance between here and there to, yeah. to having what that question is. Yeah. But it could definitely, it could definitely help. Mm -hmm. Um, all right. Well, listen, folks, we've got uh, a couple more minutes. If you have any questions for us, really mostly Mitch, but I can try to um, drop them into the Q&A. All right. There we, there we go. go. Let's see. Um, all right. It's it's apparent that legacy CI CD platforms still require a lot of manual effort to maintain, especially when compared to more modern instances uh, that sharply reduce the level of toil DevOps teams experience. What is your opinion about this? I. Hmm. So this actually came up um we were talking about modernizing DevOps platforms and kind of the shift to a platform engineering approach. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I think this, this ties into this question ties into that. Um, I think, I think DevOps is, still very, very viable and very much alive. I don't think DevOps is dead by any means, um, despite what some certain memes may want to tell you. I think platform engineering is coming into favor because it, you know, it takes that manual toil from the beginning of the process. There's, here's a whole complete platform. It's turnkey. You can go there and off you go. Um, and so I think, let's see, when compared to more modern instances of these platforms that reduce the level of toil. So yeah, I think that it, it's definitely shifting um, in, that, in that respect. And I think developers um, are actually pushing for that because they don't wanna keep building and re rebuilding and rebuilding the same elements over and over and over again. Um, that's a waste of their time. Mm -hmm. So that's my vaguely educated opinion. You Back know, to you, Mitch. <laughs> you know those signs when we go into the jewelry store or the whatever trinket store and it says, you break it, you bought it. But in software, it's that you built it, you maintain it. Right. And at some point, that grows, that backlog, that, you know, a technical debt it's just like, why are we doing this? The reasons we did it then may not be as valid as they are as they were at the time versus now. And that's a good time to maybe take the expense or the time to shift or maybe leave it as it is and move the new things to a, to a new platform that's more efficient for us to maintain. So it's, it's never easy to move off of one thing and onto another. Let's developer tools, a database or whatever it is. So sometimes you're best to kind of, that's the environment then, this is the environment going forward. But yeah, I think times change and the reasons you do things change over time as well. So, yeah. so I like your answer too. <laughs> Thanks. I bet we have some gift cards though. I bet we do. And I think it is about time to give those out. Cody. All right, so the four winners of our $25 Amazon gift card drawing are Emmanuel C, Keisha W, Jackie D, and Lars D. So to our four winners, keep an eye on your inbox to claim that gift card. It should be there in about the next 48 hours. But if you don't happen to see that, check your spam folder just in case it gets filtered out. Sharon, Mitch, thank you both so much for joining me today. Um, I really appreciate the conversation that was had and it was kind of at a, a level that was a little bit more palatable to myself. So thank you so much for this, this super uh, informational program. Anytime. Thank you. Thank you, Sharon. Thanks everyone for attending. Yeah, thanks. We appreciate it. Hope to see you again soon.
Of course, of course. Thank you both. Um, and to everyone who's joined us, thank you so much for being here. We really appreciate your time and, and really appreciate you've been here for the past hour. So we will only ask for one more minute of your time. There will be a survey that pops up as soon as we close out. Please let us know your thoughts about our program today or what you'd like to see on an upcoming program. Either way, we'd hope to see everyone at a future TechStrong learning experience. Have a great rest of your day. And again, Mitch, Sharon, thank you both so much. Thank you.